Hi, my name is Steve Gantz. I'm a head of business at DIFC Innovation Hub, and I'm excited to welcome you to DIFC Unplugged today. We're excited to welcome Dr. Ahmed Ghanem, uh, co-founder of Deep Opinion, an uh, AI startup inside of the AI campus. Ahmed, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Steve. You have a fascinating, a fascinating background. So you worked in the prime minister's office. You did a PhD at Cambridge. You graduated in 2000. I imagine when you graduated, you could have gone anywhere in the world, Silicon Valley, Zurich, London. But you chose to come back to Dubai and start a, a company here an AI company company here. So can you maybe share a little bit about your professional journey and what led you to found Deep Opinion? Absolutely. So uh, my journey has been evolutionary. <laughs> uh, no, it's uh, easier to look at uh, things in hindsight. I started actually with um, a basic degree in engineering in, in robotics and mechatronics. And back in 2008, I believe, wow, that's uh, <laughs> a while. Uh, I started my career with Emirates Airlines. Mm -hmm. Good place to start. Absolutely. You know, those large uh, enterprises, they provide you with a um, training program that really gets you to develop your professional skills. So I started as a flight simulator engineer, <laughs> not a common uh, job uh, out there. So it's very specialized. I can claim that I've been doing virtual reality before it's <laughs> being cool. So that's an advantage. I got to learn there a lot of fascinating things between, you know, how those machines work. Mm -hmm from electronics, uh, simulation, mechanical, computer science, software, and so on, as well as the massive scale of operations mm -hmm. that Emirates has. And through that journey, I've uh, always been fascinated on how much can knowledge push you further in your career mm -hmm. and what kind of uh, impact you can have in your role. And I've been always driven by that impact. So from that job, I've really continued my uh, career progression throughout the company to join different transformation programs that are focused on adopting digital technologies. And at the time, I think in 2014 or 15, we started to embed data science and analytics more extensively across Emirates. And then there I really fell in love with um, uh, AI and wanted to, do, to pursue this further as a career. And this is where I've decided around 2016 to start my, my PhD at the University of Cambridge, continued through there and also joined the prime minister's office mm. uh, during that time. And you were the, the director of future services and, and technology. So, right. so I imagine continuing kind Absolutely. of the interest around AI yes. and new technology. All my career have been around <laughs> pushing technology. Mm. And that's actually uh, taught me a few things. One is the impact that technology can have on large enterprise, but also too on how we've built large companies mm. in the past and how they operate yeah. and how they can benefit from um, emerging technologies. Those large companies are the drivers of the economy, mm. but they um, inher inherited some of the legacy ways of operating mm -hmm. that can be alleviated or transformed even with technology. And this is where, with the influence of the ecosystem in Cambridge, I've seen the impact of AI and its evolution mm -hmm. uh, firsthand. So even, for example, the founder of uh, DeepMind came out of Cambridge, yeah. the founders of ARM. And it's a legendary place. Absolutely. And this is where I really fell in love with the idea of trying to um, find the startup. Mm -hmm. I actually told myself that I'll start with 10 ideas <laughs> and I'll work my way through them during my PhD. If I get to make something work, <laughs> then I know that I'm for What it. number did you get to? What idea? Three. three. The opinion is <laughs> number three, actually. Yes. <laughs> and I've been blessed to meet my co-founders there through an accelerator program. Mm -hmm. It's also a fascinating place to form such uh, uh, networks and I would say uh, life uh, lasting mm -hmm. relationships uh, that you take for the rest of your life. So let's talk a little bit about deep. So what exactly is deep, deep opinion? What challenge, what kind of problems are you solving? Absolutely. So that's a, a, an interesting point. If you look at enterprise today, the, the core way of communication, both internally and externally with customers and suppliers is through unstructured data. Mm -hmm. And this unstructured data can be in the form of chat, emails, documents, and that requires building processes yeah. 
and teams around lots of processes exactly and and large teams so we've did, done this study and evaluating the magnitude of this problem we found that around 11 percent of the global workforce are part of cubicle farms working <laughs> on entertainment entertaining you know systems and feeding data across systems which really has no place in yeah. the future that is meant to be automated because it's yeah. it's not a job for human beings to be typing information on on keyboard on a system yeah. but rather a job for for machines and that's started the spark of the idea of of deep uh, of deep opinion we focused on ai that was what i was doing at at cambridge as well and it, as you know ai is specialized in solving human like tasks yeah. which unstructured data is uh, requiring those skills to be processed right so it and what are the use cases that your that deep opinion is best uh, best suited to to solve absolutely so uh, different ones but if i think about the uh, core uh, use cases are within um, financial services so if you look at the core services or processes that an insurance company or a bank would have because those uh, companies uh, are in a highly regulated mm -hmm. uh, sector, they are uh, required to have really thorough process mm -hmm. with a lot of communication, documentation that goes through that process that requires heavy touch from employees to read documents, review them, audit them, enter them to different systems, check it across different uh, sources of information and so on. So take, for example, the, the insurance claim process. Mm -hmm. We think that, you know, I send my invoice and then I think I should be reimbursed next day. <laughs> Reality is very different. Uh, those uh, insurance companies would take them up to five weeks to be able mm -hmm. to process uh, an insurance claim just because it's a, a purely manual process that has a long backlog. Yeah. Uh, it's your, your, your claim is stuck in, in a queue, basically. <laughs> and with AI, all of that can happen instantaneously. And so uh, generative, AI, uh, generative AI is the, the topic of the day. Everybody is, is talking about generative AI. Um, so I have to ask you, does your platform incorporate any elements of generative AI? And if so, like, how are you using it? Absolutely. So generative AI is not just transformational to deep opinion. Uh, but also to the whole economy. Mm -hmm. uh, even some of the research mentions that up to $4 trillion uh, into the global economy will be generated mm -hmm. uh, based on ge uh, generative AI applications. So we've leveraged generative AI. The, the value of generative AI that we found is that we can pass additional value and additional capabilities to our customers. In terms of technology, what it's most capable of is the thing that domain experts do on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. uh, most domain experts, they are experts because they have the knowledge in their brain and they need to evaluate something and put their judgment to complete a certain task. Because Gen AI ha have uh, demonstrated some reasoning mm -hmm. abilities, we can now use it to evaluate, for example, if an, an insurance claim is eligible mm -hmm. uh, to for a settlement or a payment or for example in a in a bank if a company is asking for a, for a loan for trade financing mm -hmm. for example is this um, compliant with the regulations and that usually requires granular uh, attention to details in um, information that are scattered across multiple sources mm -hmm. and Gen AI help us to basically automate that uh, to a very high degree. So it sounds like deep opinion, perfect use cases are kind of taking unstructured data and adding structure to that data and then kind of optimizing kind of processes and driving efficiency. I'm curious, how does this kind of compare and contrast with kind of RPA, robotic process automation? Absolutely. If you think about RPA, RPA had a tremendous role yeah. in, in automation and it focused on automating um, copy and paste tasks so, <laughs> right. or a screen automation. So where you need to automate um, clicks on a screen or right. navigating through websites or logging low, in. Low cognitive load. Low cognitive load. Uh, more deterministic, more rule-based that uh, 
you you need to provide it with a, a structured set of instructions, step one, two, and and so on. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Gen AI, you are able to say this is a case, mm -hmm. and I want you to complete uh, the uh, set of tasks that are not standardized yeah. and would require a human to reason about it. And even sometimes a general, uh, like a normal person won't be able to complete the task because it requires domain expertise. Gen AI breaks that silo between mm -hmm. the domain experts and the technology because we can communicate with this technology using natural language. Mm -hmm. So a domain expert can spend an hour, for example, sharing their experience and, and uh, instruction with the Gen AI to complete that task on their behalf. Mm. So I want to uh, uh, kind of uh, double click on the, the human piece, right? Because right. uh, there's a lot of talk uh, now about job displacement kind of uh, as a result of kind of AI technologies. But what I'm hearing you talk about is kind of collaboration between like human and machine. Can, it, it, can you expand upon that? Absolutely. So there are different school of thoughts, um, maybe starting even with the economic uh, studies. For example, if you look at the recent study by the World Economic Forum, they concluded that it's um, not like for most jobs, it's not practical to say AI will take jobs. Right. However, AI is better suited to take over certain tasks. Right. And this means that uh, certain tasks are better suited to be performed by AI and other tasks are better done by human. Now, in terms of technology and how that is shaped into a product, you would find some products work uh, as a collaborator. So for example, if you look at the interface of ChatGPT, one of the, like, the most famous mm -hmm. AI product mm -hmm. uh, that is being used, you would notice that it requires a human being actively interacting with that inter, uh, plat, um, interface mm -hmm. to get the value of AI. We actually focus on something else. We believe that there are certain tasks, especially those back office tasks that are hidden, uh, buried in paperwork, mm -hmm. are better suited to be completely taken over uh, by AI. And I, I reemphasize that those are certain tasks. Now, what implication can this have on the org structure? Keep in mind that the org structures that we have today at companies is something that we inherited from the industrial, <laughs> first right. industrial revolution. Yeah. And it's not practical. And like, we will continue to see it uh, coming out of fashion because to, it was designed to work with automation machines in factories, yeah. but not with uh, intelligent systems within modern enterprise. So we believe that the, even the, the modern uh, org structure mm -hmm. would change. With the future of work, would, we would see more uh, cross-functional employees mm -hmm. being able to handle a wide variety of tasks versus being specialized. And then it makes it easy for organizations uh, to scale. Fascinating. So I want to I want to kind of pivot a little bit. So you've uh, you're in the AI space. You've recently kind of closed a significant round of funding. I suspect you're probably going to be raising raising soon. Uh, how are you using using that funding and kind of what's ahead for you? Yes, absolutely. So we've we've been uh, fortunate and uh, blessed with our journey so far. We started Deep um, Opinion as a technology R and D project in us looking for a technology in the first place to help uh, automate um, some operational work that we had as, as friends uh, in, a, in a previous business. And that did not really, we weren't able to find the right technology in the market and we determined to build this. We've uh, managed to push the boundary of the technology because we focused on deep tech and on R&D from the beginning. We've also proven uh, traction with customers. We have customers between the UAE and Europe that are scaling our solution. So that market is also uh, proven. We see the value. We see that we are ahead of competition for certain reasons. And that's why we are placing our future investment on a couple of directions. One is continuing that focus on R&D mm -hmm. to make sure that we, we lead the, we call it the, um, agentic automation. Mm. So with, with generative AI and, and uh, um, AI agents, mm. we want to focus on that. So we want to continue with R&D. 
and we want to expand our uh, go-to-market motion that was mainly uh, founder driven in the beginning with a bit of support but now uh, we're scaling it up to have uh, more people in, in our go-to-market as well. So let's talk about about go-to-market right so you and your co-founders Cambridge University uh, but you made a decision to come back to Dubai, right, and and start a part of the company here. Why, like, what informed that decision? And well, are there kind of unique challenges that you're kind of trying to solve in the region that kind of inspired you to come back? Absolutely. So there are different ones. I would start maybe by the personal reasons. I'm originally from the UAE, and I've experienced the phenomenal growth of right. the region and the impact it brought on our lives and the life of the people that are living here. So I would like to continue my contribution to that region. That is an, uh, my first personal goal. But also, if you look at it from purely economic perspective, Dubai happens to be the absolute place to be for the whole Eastern Hemisphere. <laughs> this is like the hub and beyond. Plus, we have a country that is in adopting flexible regulations, yeah. agile and future focused. So it's the right place uh, to harness emerging technology. And we can even see this represented in the government where we have a minister of AI, yeah. when no country wanted <laughs> to do that, which helped to pave the way for us. We have all leaders in the UAE basically work on an open door policy. They come to us and say, you know, let's have a discussion. This mm -hmm. is what we do. Those are our priorities. How can we work together? Yeah. Then it's up to us to innovate and bring the right technology and work together. We basically form the economy. We found a, an, a great opportunity for growth in the UAE. And we are actually using this not just to scale in the UAE, yeah. but be our launch pad. Uh, for the region as well. And I know Sheikh Hamdan recently announced 22 new chief AI officers of cross-government ministries. Um, is government an important part of your, your growth strategy when it comes to scaling the company? Absolutely, especially in the region. Typically, government would be um, more hesitant to right. adopt technology. And but, slow. Absolutely. But here in the UAE, we already um, have success stories with different government entities because one, they have the AI strategy but even before some of the commercial companies did, and they have the right team so we can have the right conversation with them, understand their priorities. They have a clear roadmap on what they want to achieve. They have a process for innovating with startups, yeah. which makes us extending uh, the value of our technology to them and to the citizens in the UAE, a more practical journey. So I, I want to I want to come back to the the idea of regulation and progressive regulation. So uh, the EU has recently passed the the AI Act. They take a very black and white stance on what's allowed, what's what's not allowed, what's kind of categorized as high risk processing. Do you think that creates opportunities in other markets that are more progressive with their regulatory regimes? Absolutely. So the the future of AI and how would this uh, unbundle mm -hmm. is not not 100% clear, otherwise it would be an, an easy journey forward. So different uh, governments are uh, giving it their best shot in what to regulate and what not. It's easier to, to, to put red tape because mm -hmm. then you, know, you focus on minimizing risk. But what about minimi like lost opportunities? Yeah. And this is what we've seen that some governments uh, would focus on what's not allowed, yeah. while others would actually, for example, if you look at the UAE, we have break labs mm -hmm. that would allow you to, to even have a sandbox environment to try cutting edge ideas that yeah. has the potential. And if that scales, it will be integrated to the economy. So different markets have different requirements. Mm -hmm. And we've been focused on not just having the best technology, but we, we want to also have uh, the most secure and safest AI product yeah. for enterprise to make sure that we are compatible with different markets. Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me.